Now, the more interesting thing is when something's actually moving and momentum is changing. Um, what do we do? Now, note that, so we're still going to do all this stuff. But now we're going to need to worry about this side, too, because as momentum's changing, we need, at the instant we choose, we have to choose an instant, and then we have to say what dp dt is. And because it's a vector, there's two pieces to it. There's a magnitude and a direction. And if we can get the direction of dp dt, then we've got the direction of f net because those two vectors have to have the same direction if they're equal to each other. Um, so let's think about what we know about getting directions of things like dp dt. We've never done that, but we certainly have gotten the direction of delta p, a change in p, right? So, and we, we know how to do that graphically. We take, if we have some momentum, p initial, and some other momentum, p final, we, delta p is just p final minus p initial, of course. And so we put the vectors tail to tail. And then we draw the result vector which way? From initial to final. So we've got, so that's delta p. Well, dp dt is just the limit of delta p over delta t as we take delta t smaller and smaller and smaller. So even if an object is following some sort of complicated path, its momentum is changing continually, if we, and we want to know, let's say, what dp dt is when it's right there at that instant, we can actually still use this approach. So what we can do is say, well, I'm going to take a finite time interval. So I'm going to draw the momentum a short time before this, and I'm going to draw the momentum that same time after this. So the time interval is going to. And then I'll actually just subtract and get a delta p. So let's see. I'm going to exaggerate here just so I can draw it on the board. We'll take p initial here. So it's going to be something like that. And so let's say the same time after that, it's here. And so we've got a p final. And as we get closer and closer together, they approach each other. But we'll take this big interval to see what we get here. So we'll draw a p initial. And we'll put p final. And so it looks interestingly like delta p is in that direction and so maybe dp dt here is actually pointing down so we already have all the mechanism we need for finding directions of dp dt so let's just think about this a little bit um, We'll practice a little bit. OK, so this is our old friend, uh, mass on spring, doing this. OK, ball hangs from end of vertical spring. It does this, bounces up and down. What we're going to consider is the very bottom of the oscillation. Gets right down to here, the very bottom, okay? The momentum is zero because it's stopped instantaneously. What's the direction of dp dt at that instant? So we have a procedure. So you probably can't help guessing, but then you got to check it by using the procedure. Okay, so. 40% say up, 5% say down, 
and 55%, more than half the class, say zero magnitude, no direction. Did you use the procedure? Okay, so let's let's do it together, and we'll see what we get. Okay, so here's the thing at the bottom where it's momentarily at rest. So we need to take uh, a little time before and a little time after. So let's draw a picture of a little time before. It's here. And what's the direction of the momentum of the block at this instant? It's going down. OK, so we have a p initial. And now momentum 0. And then it starts going back up, right? So we're back to the same location. And now what's the direction of the momentum? Up. Uh-huh. P final. And so now to get delta P, what do we do? Put the vectors tail to tail. So we have P final. P initial. And now we draw a vector according to U, starting at P initial and going to P final. And that looks like delta P. And so, in fact, it looks like delta P over delta T. Yeah, that's a positive number. Is certainly going to be up. And we're going to keep getting the same answer, even if we take times closer and closer to the bottom because it's still going down until it stops and it's still going right up. Okay, so the moment rate of change of momentum. Well, what so what you really have to do is you would have to draw that, right? But that's just impossible to see what you're doing. So what I did is just move it over. Okay, yes. Well, for clarity. But but so this is this is this is what you do, and I just moved it over so we could see what we're doing. Okay, questions about that? Okay, so think about the momentum principle and see if you can answer this question. Where? So we're going to apply. We've, does everyone agree that dp dt, when this is at the bottom, dp dt is in fact up? We okay with that? We're good with that. All right. Apply the momentum principle. What's the direction of the net force at that instant? Talk to your neighbor. OK, well, 86% take the momentum principle seriously. Yes. So if, if dp dt is upward, then the direction of the net force has to be upward too, doesn't it, according to the momentum principle. Now, now let's think about this for a minute, though. When if I could ever get it to hang motionless, let's pretend it's motionless. If it's hanging motionless and it's, well, it's hanging motionless. It's not bouncing, all right? At this instance, so then what's, we just, we already did this analysis. What's dp dt? Wait. It's zero, isn't it? When it's it's hanging motionless because uh, a microsecond before now it's motionless and a microsecond after now it's motionless and zero minus zero is zero. So, so dp dt is zero and the net force is zero. That's statics, right? What's different? How come we just got that the net force is up with the bottom of this? It's motionless, isn't it? 
Well, we concluded that was our, our logic was we know dp dt is up, so the net force must be up. And in fact, it's down there. The earth is pulling it down. Something better be pulling it up. So the net force better be up to make it go up again. The difference is it's only momentarily motionless. It's, moment, it's motionless for an instant, but not forever. And notice how long the spring is. Okay, So if it just hangs here, more or less motionless, the spring is stretched that much. But at the bottom, the string is, spring is stretched more, isn't it? So it's going to exert a bigger force than if it's just hanging there balancing gravity. So in fact, it is going to pull it up. So physically, it actually does it actually does make sense. And so we have to be a little careful. The fact that something is motionless at a given instant doesn't mean that its momentum is not changing. Okay, that's the beauty of calculus. Instantaneous rate of change is not equal to the value of the. So, so. Uh, so we have to be careful. OK, let's do one other dpdt thing. Here's, uh, here's a comet in some orbit around the sun. Uh, so the turquoise arrow there is the initial momentum, and the tail of the arrow is at the location where that's measured. The second arrow, labeled p final, is the momentum at the end of some time interval. Okay, and the tail is at the location where it's measured. And we've got three red arrows there labeled one, two, and three. And the question is, which of these red arrows represents delta P, the change of momentum of the comet between those two instances? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's actually just gotten worked out for you here, right? <laughs> so here's P initial, there's P final. You need to draw, okay, so follow the procedure. So, so that suggests that at some intermediate instant here-ish, uh, dP dt sort of looks like that. So we're starting to see that the rate of change of momentum is not necessarily in the direction of momentum. In fact, it often isn't, especially if the object is actually turning. So let's look at an example uh, that may look sort of familiar to some of you at this point. This is, this is a comet orbiting the sun, actually. but. Um, Okay, the Python program. Okay, so here's here's an elliptical orbit like like that of a comet uh, orbiting the sun. Is the momentum of the comet changing? Absolutely, it certainly is. Let's let's look at the rate of change of momentum of the comet. Let's put let's So what we're going to look at here is this little cyan arrow is dp dt, a purple arrow. Sorry, but okay. So does that seem about right? Okay, and not very surprisingly, <coughs> it happens to be in the same direction as the net force on the comet, which is surely the gravitational force. Now, one thing that is useful to do, and we'll talk more about this next time, is to think about splitting that vector dp dt into two other, the sum of two other vectors. You can always write a vector as the sum of two other vectors. And so here's our magenta dp dt vector again. And we're, we're writing it here as the, dividing it into two pieces. 
there's one piece that's parallel and on, along the same line as the momentum of the, the comet. Okay, so we call it DPDT parallel, um, even though it it could be pointing opposite to the momentum, but it's and the other piece is a is a is a component that's perpendicular to the momentum. So we're we're taking and and just as we can divide any vector into the sum of a vector on the x-axis plus the sum of a vector on the y-axis plus the sum of a vector on the z-axis. We can choose any axes we want. So we're, we're looking at parallel and perpendicular components of the PDT. And it turns out that the component of the PDT that's parallel to the momentum, as with the, the mass on the spring, that has to do with changing magnitude of momentum, speeding up or slowing down. If something's speeding up or slowing down but not turning, then dp dt is going to be parallel to the momentum. This piece perpendicular, that's the piece that corresponds to momentum turning. Okay, And you may remember way back we talked about you needed a force perpendicular to motion to turn something. Well, you need a component of dp dt perpendicular to the momentum to turn the momentum. Let me just show you one more thing, and we'll talk about what this is on Wednesday. So the red, the red line is the orbit. What's this green circle? Is a force a circle? <laughs> well, how does this how does this green circle compare to the trajectory of the Notice that the green circle is always tangent to the orbit at the point where the comet is. And notice that its radius of curvature is always equal to the local radius of curvature at the point where the comet is. Okay, the circle is called technically the osculating circle. That's a mathematical name for it. It's the the circle that's that's tangent to a path and has the same radius of curvature of the path. It's also called the kissing circle because it kisses the trajectory at that point. And we can see that the, the kissing circle has the same curvature as the orbit, but its radius changes. And we can also see that this perpendicular component of dp dt points toward the center of the kissing circle. So we'll talk more about that next time.